Kathy Paper, unleash your inner rock star. Does somebody like sound an alarm when it starts? Or are we just, Travis, are you and I working together? Okay, so here's the first slide. Welcome, thank you, I'm Kathy Paper. Uh, happy to be here. We're going to cover Unleash Your Inner Rockstar in 20 slides. This is one of them. So everybody take a deep breath. On your table is a little prize should you choose to be kind of a big deal um, that you can fill out a goal by the end of it. I'm going to explain the framework. Take a look at some of these people on here. Some of them you may know, some of them you may not know. These are rock stars in their own right. What is it that you know about them? What makes them memorable? Something that they've done. Of course, we have Rick for his trips to Mexico, putting on this good group, a round of applause. We want to identify what your brand is. How do you put your inner rock star out there a little bit more? What are you known for? It's a combination of style and substance. It can't just be one or the other. It won't work. So the rock star is connecting to what that is. I've worked for the past 15 years with speakers and authors all over the country, helping them launch their brand. Up there is Harvey McKay, the New York Times number one best-selling author of Swim with the Sharks Without Being Eaten Alive. How many in the room have read the book? All right, good. We need all the hands up, so we'll have to work on that. But what are you known for? What makes you memorable? If he had titled his book, Prepare to Win, you wouldn't have known it. Swim with the Sharks is memorable. When you Google yourself, take a look. It's not all about who's up here in the, in the column that you are. It's who else are they searching for? Who else are you looking for? 398,000 books on sales. And he's one of the top 15 books in the world. Okay, You want to pay attention to how your brand is memorable. I have put together a 10-point assessment to help people step into the spotlight, to go through these steps of taking a look at your brand from all vantage points. Are you consistent? Whether you have a book or not, are you consistent? If I look at your LinkedIn, if I look at your Facebook, will I see the same thing? So take stock. SAT, ACT, we take the tests, we study for them, we know where we're at. Take stock of your personal brand, take stock of your professional brand. Know where you're strong, where you're not, where you need areas to improve upon. It helps you grow. I'm gonna run you through a few of the things to really be the rock star, to know yourself. Who's taken the Strength Finder book? Again, similar number of hands. Everybody should go up because sometimes our strength, those things that make us the rock star, it's too close to us. Prince, he's from in town, lived in, went to school at St. Paul Central. Okay? He figured out what his best assets were, combination of marketing, songwriting, everything. You have to have a vision. If you don't have a vision, you don't know where you're going. Make a vision. It's strategic planning with images. Cut them out. Think about clients you want to work with. Think about what it is you want to know. Imagine yourself on the stage. Women made vision boards. Guys maybe hung posters. You've got to do some of that. You need to tell a story. To start becoming a rock star, what's your point of view? What is the one thing you can be known for? 400 words to start building your buzz. What are the words? What is it? Sales pipeline. Here's an author, sales pipeline. 400 words. She told a story. Boom, come a lot of clients. Boom comes the credibility of being a business journal writer. LinkedIn, there are people that can tell you a lot more about LinkedIn than I can, but put your best foot forward. So this is a before shot of one of my clients. Teeny little photo says, I don't care. No title that says that he's spoken on the stage with Kenneth Bran Branson, that he's a rock star. You've got to put that in there. And then, speaking of books, you need to go for it. So Dina Simon in the middle center there, raise your hand because she went for it and put a book together. <laughs> You have to go for it. And when you go for it, go big. Get in Barnes & Noble. Do it. Put your words out there. So round of applause for doing that. I help people get their launches out. You have to speak up. Chris Farrell, who's on the NPR station and a well-known brain, wanted to do more speaking. He got the coaching. To be a rock star, you need to get that coaching to become better, to speak up and speak out. I talked to him 20 minutes before coming here. He's going to Puerto Rico to speak to all the securities development, somebody in government in Puerto Rico. Anyway, you got to have that. Building a great team. Shout out to Darren Lynch, who's here, who's on my team. Michelle LeBeau, Tracy Arnold, Betsy Buckley, Rick, everybody. Have a good team. This is the All Blacks from New Zealand. I was a rugby player in college. And you know what? You need a good team. 
You need good people around you. Who are your top 25 that are going to talk you up? Use your best assets. Joe Sweeney is a client of mine from Wisconsin. Happened to be Brett Favre's first agent. When I first met him, he had already made a New York Times bestseller. He didn't want to talk about Brett Favre. I said, Joe, I hate to break it to you. Nobody's heard of an Irish kid from Wisconsin, but they've heard of Brett Favre. We're using this photo from 20 years ago. We're talking about that you worked with him. And then we converted these into tools so we could monetize his message. So again, for your business or for your personal brand, what are you trying to do? Packaging. Packaging is so critical to having the tools to go with it. Here's another example. <clears throat> Sweet, I get to take a deep breath. <laughs> Here's another example of a company that's brilliant, lead pages on packaging their intellectual property. Web pages, landing pages that they've packaged, they've got the assets of people that they've worked with, they're showcasing it, they're monetizing it in subscriptions, they've taken what they do well and multiply it. What's your intellectual property that you're sitting on that you're not showcasing? You've got to start thinking that way. And then be strategic. You can't run a marathon without a training plan. So make a plan. We have the 91 day track starts, track start, 91 day rock star plan so you can take those 10 steps to the spotlight. Map it out. You need to know what you're starting with with the assessment, your goal, and what you want to accomplish. I aim big. So when TCF Bank first opened, I wanted to hold an event there. And I went there, checked it out, signed the contract, and looked at the woman touring me around and said, how much is it going to cost me to get all my clients' images up on the screen? She's like, we've never done that before. I go, will you find out? I want to do it. So $500 in a startup budget was a lot to spend, but I did it because you have to unleash your inner rock star. You have to show up big and bold. You have to believe that you're kind of a big deal and set your goal and go for it. So I encourage all of you, take the last seven seconds. What's your goal? Put yourself out there and have the other people around you know what you're excited about. Thank you. Betsy Buckley is here to talk about Ask Why First. Betsy Buckley. I'd love to be a rock star, but I've only got six minutes and 40 seconds. So I'm going to talk to you about something that I believe in with all my heart. Four years ago, I started a book club here at the Minneapolis Club. I was a member then, not your interim general manager. I'm about to be done being your interim general manager. But I started this business book club, and this past year we read a book, Simon Sinek's Start With Why. Who's read it? Awesome book, awesome book. I consider why my holy grail. And I can't wait to use this time to talk to you about why is what matters to me. Of course, we all remember learning the five W's and the one H. I knock them all out, and I go directly to why. Now, here's Cynic's picture. What? How? Why in the center? It's the driver of our decision making. It hits the limbic brain first. Most of us need to persuade somebody, much of the time, about something why we'll do that. There is no appeal to logic without an parallel appeal to emotion. And the question why will pull that emotion out. It's almost always the missing piece in the puzzle. And it strips the mask. And it gets us right to the core of what really matters. It is not situation-based. Remember that phrase. It is not situation-based. When we think about why as the answer, what Simic did is he said, OK, if this is in the center, the reason it's in the center is because that is what will drive us. If we start with what, what is the product? What is the service? When we start talking about what, guess what? It's all about us. When we start talking about how, it's even worse. It describes how we do something. If we start with what or how, it's all about us. And some of you have seen my bracelets, ATT, ATT, all about them all the time. If we need to persuade someone, we have to start with them, not with us. Now, this is a great example. Uh, if I was trying to buy 
persuade you to buy something. And I said, I have beautifully styled, fashion-forward shoes, lots of colors, plenty of sizes. Do you want to buy some? Are you excited? Do you really want to get in there? Uh-uh. Because what I want to know as a buyer is, what can you do for me? What can you bring to me? I don't really care how you stock the shoes. I don't care how you buy the shoes. I don't care even what the shoes are. I want to be like Apple. Apple doesn't say, hi, boys and girls, I got an iPad for you. They start with the why. They say, we're going to do it different. We always have. We always will. Those of us who are contrarians get kind of excited. Then they tell us about the products, and then they tell us more detail. Why will inspire us? How is descriptive? And what is just the facts, man? And I can tell you, as a person who is driven and passionate about why, the reason that I am is it's the fulcrum on the teeter-totter. It's the bottom part. It's the part that balances. It's not that big, heavy what. And it's not all those little weights that are procedural and describe step A, step B, step C. It's the fulcrum. It's the balance point. The what's are just the stuff. And guess what? Nobody is buying stuff today. When we think about the hows, the hows really well beyond the what's, it's, it's like all the steps. It's, you remember the, the guy who, when you would say, what time is it? The watchmaker would want to tell you how he made the watch. Do any of us care? I don't think so. It's, it's the methodology, and methodologists are not motivating. What's motivating is the vision. What's motivating is the quick answer to why. What's motivating is the driver. And what's motivating is the piece that gets to our emotions and stays there. So we start with why. We move to how. We get to what. But sometimes all we have to do is stay in that circle of why. Instead of wandering down a, a really very uncertain path, feeling like that weight of the what and the how is driving us crazy, you're trying to introduce yourself to somebody here, and they say, what do you do? And you say, I'm a biological scientist. Who's smiling at you? Can't wait to meet you. Oh, it's so nice to meet you, Ms. Biological Scientist. It's, it's, it's a path that's going nowhere. We can take three different steps. All of us are facile enough to do that and to, and to carry a conversation forward, but it doesn't get to the core. What, what really doesn't bore the buyer or slow down the uncertain decision maker takes us right back to the shoe story. So let me tell you, last week, getting into the fall, got to have a new pair of shoes, have no time. Walk into the store. I've got 10 minutes. The clerk comes up and does not say, what do you want? They say, why are you here today? And I say, I want to be taller. I want to be comfortable. I want to not look down on anybody else, and I don't want them looking down on me. I want to feel like I'm 5'8", and I'm happy, and I'm satisfied. She asked me why, and in five minutes, I had the right shoes, I walked out the door, I was a happy woman, and I got him on to prove it. <laughs> Ask why. So we're going to explore this question of should you sell your business and, uh, and uh, go, or should you stay and grow it, OK? And uh, again, my name is Chris Jones of Sunbelt. We've been helping people answer this question for oh, uh, three, four decades ourselves, since 1978. I've been in it 15 years. And it's a really important question that, that uh, business owners need to answer. On a long enough timeline, everybody has to answer the question of how they're going to exit their business. So question for the group. 
and you don't need to say this out loud, but what price would it take for you to sell your business now? Now, many business owners I talk to say that they don't have that number, they want us to tell them that number, but they have a number, okay? So I want you to keep that number in your head, and I'm gonna help you answer that question today. Now, what about price? Betsy, your comment about why, okay? It's a combination of that dollar sign and why. If it's just about the money, you probably won't sell. If you don't have a why what you're gonna do, like I do, when I'm ready to exit, that beach in Hawaii happens to be a place I wanna be with a new venture down there and it's close to my son's Marine Corps base. That's my why. For one of our clients, he sold two companies with us and went and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro with his daughter to raise money for cancer, okay? Now, I did my part to support Hawaii. He did his part for his cause. He was a little more noble than mine. But everybody has that why. But you do need to answer the price question. You do need to answer that dollar sign. So I'm gonna help you do that. A lot of it's driven by valuation multiples. Who's heard of valuation multiples? Good, all right. Driven by growth and risk. The green arrow's good, the red arrow's bad. Rick told me to keep this simple, so. All right, the next question is, well, what are the multiples? The multiples are driven largely the size of the company, okay? I just concept, um, you don't necessarily need to remember these numbers. But these are the averages, so these are very deceiving. It's kind of like putting boiling hot water with cold water and saying that they're both warm. What we really want to look at are these ranges. Now look at the middle range there. A one to five million dollar revenue company, on average, could sell from anywhere from three to six times. That's a twice as much difference, okay? So let's dive into a little, that a little bit and see why that is. And we're gonna use this little pyramid or mountain, as I like to call it, as our example and figure out how companies get to the higher part or if somebody's a million in revenue, how do they get to four versus two, which is a range, because everybody wants a higher multiple, probably, okay? So let's dive into that a little bit. And then also we'll talk about the upper range. Now you don't need to worry about the text that's in these little blocks, but remember our green and red? Green is good, red is bad. What you want to look at are value drivers or the value lever. And in general, if you're an average company, you're gonna get an average multiple. Pretty simple concept. Equal amount of positives and negatives. But look what happens when we put more positives, okay? We're now talking about a million dollar revenue company that instead of getting a two or three multiple, could enjoy a four time multiple. And you as business owners can control that. It's very measurable. Now in our next slide, we're gonna see that you can have an even more dramatic impact but we're not gonna have time to do this today, but I will tell you, I normally would hand out a little score sheet where you could see particularly where your business scores. And if anybody wants that from me, I'm happy to send it to you. But this can be measured, and if it can be measured, it can be improved and help you answer that question, should I stay and grow and address some of these issues or sell and go? You can figure out what your value driver scores are. You can figure out those red and greens. So, as part of looking at grow or go, and where you might fall in this pyramid, and whether there's a why behind you leaving the business and doing your next thing and pursuing your why, you also have to think like a buyer. Are these concave or convex? Depends what side of the room you're on, right? Is this bending towards Betsy or away? But it's different for somebody on this side of the room. That is very similar to the way buyers and sellers look at companies. So an example, anybody seen these bike racks around town? This is a company we sold, Darrow, who makes these. Number one player in this space. A company called Playcor bought them. Another example, national company that does outdoor furniture that bought their way into this space. Thinking like a buyer allows you to say, are there buyers out there? Another way to think like a buyer, and you don't need to look at this math, but the concept of this slide is, don't leave money on the table. How many people here like to pay taxes? The hands never go up, okay? So what happens when you show your tax return to a buyer? It might be difficult to convince them that that low tax number is an exciting proposition to invest in. Another way to think like a buyer is to figure out who those buyers are. Most business owners know the people that are close to them. Who are those people? Employees and competitors. Those also happen to be the people who pay the least for your company. 
And if you pursue those, you'll almost, almost always say, stay and grow, because you won't hit your price. How many customers would you like to have? Probably as many as possible, right, that you can support and take care of. So why wouldn't you want as many buyers? Many business owners limit themselves to one or two buyers, which puts them in a position where they are not in a good position to sell and go. Another thought for you, and this one sometimes gets booed, consider not getting all cash for your business. Uncle Sam's gonna take a good piece when you sell, which sometimes keeps people from going and pursuing their why. Terms are a way to address that and often get paid more. Here's my final thought for you. Uh, the, the folks that have been in their business five, 10, 20, 30 years, these are part of only 5% of the population that own businesses. So if you're a business owner, you've already made a big decision of being a business owner. And if you're an employee or a vendor for one of them, walk up to them and hug them, don't explain why, and thank them for taking that risk of being a business owner and tell them you understand. All right, thank you. Kate and Mark are here to talk to us about what's happening in the commercial real estate world. It's a couple tough acts to follow, but uh, very excited to be here. So we can roll with our presentation. Hey everyone, thanks for having us here today. I'm Kate Gillette and this is Mark Evenson from Avison Young Commercial Real Estate. In the next six minutes and 40 seconds, we're gonna give you the rundown on the Twin Cities commercial real estate market, including some stats on the market, workplace trends, and some predictions for the future. If you're wondering why you should take our word for it, Avis & Young is an international commercial real estate firm with over 1,900 employees across 69 offices. Two of us here today have over 40 years of combined experience, and we believe in helping people make intelligent real estate decisions through a focus on partnership and a dedication to performance. The first question most people ask is, how's the market? Well, it tends to be a complex answer and differs greatly from sub-market to sub-market and building to building. But here's a quick snapshot on what is happening in the Twin Cities real estate market with regards to vacancy, some rental rates and construction costs, and some of the info on some of the hottest markets. Vacancy rates are trending downward with the exception of St. Paul. Job growth is the obvious contributor to this drop. The number should be down even further if it wasn't for the fact that most companies in all sectors are changing the way they work. The hottest submarkets, the North Loop and the 394 corridor, by far, live in the old real estate adage, location, location, location. When vacancy rates go down, it only makes sense that rates should go up. The rental rates you see reflect full service office rental rates. It's been a long way, but it, they're starting to tick up after about 18 years of being fairly flat. So at these prices, it's still difficult, though, for a developer to think about building a building. With the exception, again, of 394 and North, North Loop being the exception, uh, where it was a very active market. The construction costs are the biggest factor impacting the leasing market today. The dramatic rise in construction are trending up at a rate of about 1% a month. Today, many contractors will automatically add 20 to 25% to their bids in order to just address the foreseeable increases that may occur. These numbers reflect the cost of a per square foot basis on a typical office build out in the Twin Cities and reflect a standard finish, nothing even very fancy. So while there are market trends, every building is in a way its own market. One of the best performing markets right now is the North Loop and brick and timber buildings. Colonial Warehouse, Butler Square, and Tractor Works are all over 90% leased, loose wiles at 100%. This is leading to development or redevelopment of some pretty cool new properties. T3 on the top stands for Timber Transit and Technology. It is a new brick and timber building off of Washington. And below that is the uh, upcoming and welcomed redevelopment of the former Sex World building <laughs> to office space, which looks a little swankier. So what's driving this change in momentum? Many factors, including the overall growth of Minneapolis, the demands of millennials and their growing presence in the workforce, the overall speed of change that we're currently experiencing, and the draw of cities as people and businesses are moving from the suburbs back to the downtown areas. The good, new, the good news for the landlord and developers is that the future continues to look bright for job growth in Minnesota. You can see from this slide that we are even growing faster than Chicago. Our diverse economy supports consistent growth in our community. There's always a few industry sectors that are performing better than others, which keeps us constantly on a growth curve, creating new jobs and a stronger economy. 
Not only commerce through increase in white collar jobs, but also our changing culture in the U.S. is causing there to be an increase in the demand for commercial real estate. This year will be the 65th year marking the increase in the urban population. Close to 85% of our country now live in urban areas. It's a common topic. We'd just not to touch on millennials in the workforce. Teen millennials represented approximately 36% of the workforce, but by 2030, they will represent nearly 75% of the workforce. This is impacting everything in the work environment from design to technology to social hierarchy and even the idea of work and productivity in general. And how about the speed of change? The workplace changes every 10 years, workforce shifts about every five, business itself changes every three, political shift occurs every two, and technology changes about every six months, if not faster. These are huge factors when you consider that companies are signing five, seven, or even longer year leases. Many other factors that are contributing to this workplace shift include the talent war, transit, a growing desire for flexibility to work remotely or in a non-traditional and multiple generations in the workforce, force, although force, boomers and Gen X are still major players for the time being. Not since the explosion in the white collar workforce has there been such a dramatic change in the way we work. The hierarchy associated with one's physical position in the office is dying a quick death. Senior managers, partners, and others who have worked their way up to the corner office now tend to work in smaller interior offices or out on the floor with everyone else. Beyond the people piece, there's also less need for large storage areas, mail rooms, production, copy, collating space, libraries. All have gone the way of the server and the cloud. With all that paper and without all those large private offices, why would you need any more space? Well, you do not. The numbers per person are dropping precipitously. How about more than 55%? You can see how we are now designing and using office space. It has dramatically changed. How we occupy our space and how much we occupy will ultimately shape the buildings we choose to work in. Hopefully, we will find ways to continue to repurpose the existing structures, such as in the Great Loop, or the North Loop, excuse me, a great way to maintain our offices, keep our land dumps from overflowing, and the urban areas from sprawling out of control. Today's real estate strategies tend to fall into one of four categories. Go with the status quo, stay but reconfigure and renovate the space to incorporate new ways of working, stay, compress, reconfigure, and renovate to reduce the overall footprint, or relocate and start with a fresh canvas, which may also be driven by a desire for new location or concessions. And what will the future hold? Despite all the press the open office gets, the emerging trend we're seeing is a return to focus and balance. Regardless of age or generation, companies and employees alike are realizing that an environment for focused work is essential. Not talking about going back to all private offices, but creating zones for this type of work. Whew, that was a lot to cover in under seven minutes. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. If you'd like to know more about any of the topics we discussed in greater detail, please feel free to reach out to us. We're always happy to be a resource for any of your real estate and facility questions. Thank you very much. For the last uh, 26 years, I have been working with leaders who are nonprofit and for-profit executives and help them with their career transitions. My name is George Dow and my firm is George Dow Consulting. And you can go ahead and get us started. There you go. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the pursuit of happiness and the people that come to me are coming to me because either they're in a transition searching for the next opportunity or they're unhappy in their work. And so what I'm trying to do is to help them to see the possibilities. And what you see here is this Sherpa. I think that's probably the best way to describe what I do. I'm a career Sherpa. This is Tenzig Norgay, uh, maybe the only Sherpa you might know the name of. And he was the first to climb Mount Everest. And what happens when people come to me is they say, I'd like to climb some new mountain. Help me figure out which one, how to get there from here. And there are three main mountains that people think about climbing, either a career transition, a career transformation, or a career two-step. I'll be describing all three of those directions for you and starting out with career transition. What happens in a career transition is it's going to be another job a lot like the last job. And we begin by looking in the rearview mirror, looking back and trying to figure out what's been most satisfying, what's been most successful, looking back over your stories. I have people come up with their top 
eight achievements and dissect them to figure out where have I been at my best and what abilities have been revealed by those experiences. And then second, look at motivation, the drive that's applied to capabilities. And you end up with a formula that's ability times motivation equals performance. But that's never enough because if you talk to recruiters, and we've got a few in this room, what they'll tell you is there'll be three, six, ten candidates. They'll all have the ability and the motivation. The one that gets the job is typically the, most, mo the best fit. The one that fits the organization, the culture, the boss, the one that's the best fit typically gets the job. And so what I do is I help people with the assessment of what's next and then provide some direction on resume, LinkedIn, but then the campaign. And in the campaign, typically, it's the 65 to 80 percent solution. Networking, I started this 26 years ago. This hasn't changed a bit. So this is the book I recommend. It's called The 20-Minute Networking Guide, and I give it to every client that comes my way. So that's a transition, looking at another job similar to the last job. But what if you want to do a transformation? It's when a client comes to me and says, is it too late to run away and join the circus? Because that's what they're feeling. They're feeling like they're, they're in a circus, maybe, but they want a different one. And they want a, an idea of how do you do that? If it's a really radical change, how does one do that? And over the years, I've found that this book is my favorite on the subject. It's called Working Identity by an author named Hermania Ibarra. She came up with this book and, and this concept to help people who are perhaps needing to not be quite so introspective to be, but to be really action biased, to be more doer than dreamer, to get out there and first craft experiments. If you're thinking about a radical transformation, you've got to try it. Try it on for size. See if it's a good fit. Experiment with it. And instead of always going back to the same people that you talk to, shift connections. Move to people that are maybe outside of your circle. People that, um, that's interesting. I thought the slide would be up by now. Um, Shift to people who are outside of your circle because they're going to take you to new places. We tend to go with the familiar. We tend to keep going back to the familiar. Uh, but you've got to break away and find people that can take you to that new place. And then after the experiments, after the new connections, we've got to make sense. We've got to take account of what have we learned uh, with those experiments, with those new connections. And what happens when people are making sense, the most common destination of my clients is to join the free agent nation. There's probably quite a few in the, of you in this room that are independent consultants or contractors, people that have moved in that direction of the free agent world. Daniel Pink wrote this book in 2001. It's a great book. And I came to a conference, and I heard Daniel Pink speak with my colleagues, other career coaches. And we said, this sounds like uh, it's, it's coming, and it's growing in momentum, and it really has. But what are the dark sides? What are the, 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 the challenges? And one of the challenges is uh, that, that photograph needs to be pushed up a little bit. The, uh, it is actually um, uh, isolation. Uh, the, the, the word is hiding behind the picture. Isolation, fear, inability to leverage resources. We name the three biggest challenges of uh, solo entrepreneurship. And fortunately, the next year, 2002, Daniel Pink wrote a book that, a sequel to the book that had a resource guide, Free Agent Nation Part Two. And he offered 101 free agent survival tips. And you'll see a, a blog there, January 2012 blog. On my website, georgedow.com, I have a number of blogs, about 50 blogs. This is one of them that helps explain what are the 101 free agent tips. And this is probably the best one, to form a fan club, to form a group that is a free agent nation club. Because as the African proverb goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So the blog talks about pulling together people that can help support your success over time. I formed mine about six years ago. The career two-step with Fred and Ginger here, it's looking at, all right, a lot of clients need to get a big job next. A transition or a transformation is the next step. But they say, what's after that? When can I get off the hamster wheel? I've heard that a few times. And what typically is the preferred designation gets back to that life balance question. A broader, when, when it's economically feasible, when money doesn't leverage it as much, a better blend of life and work. This is a great book by David Corbett, The Portfolio Life. And what that looks like, in the next slide you'll see the pie is sliced in three main pieces. Personal, professional, and community slices. And that blog I did in October 2014 
describes it. it is a portfolio of life right for you. When the time is right, after maybe the next big job, this is a really great destination. I've given you lots of things to think about in a very short time. And on the bottom of this next slide is my email address, george at georgedow.com. There's my email and my web address, and you can go look at my blogs. I've provided three career choices, four books, three blogs, and can you hear Gene Autry in the background? Happy trails to you. Thank you very much.